All right, so as we finish finish up aneuploidy, I just want to share with you one more example of non-disjunction, and this actually occurs in um, Drosophila, or the housefly, and this is a condition called a mosaicism, and the mosaicism is really where we see non-disjunction happen at the mitotic division level. And what this does is it generates patches of cells where every cell has a chromosome abnormality and then the other patches um, end up being normal. So this individual that we're looking at here is a gonandromorph. I know it sounds like something off of Harry Potter. Maybe. I've never seen it. Couldn't tell you. Um, but it sounds cool. So this individual is... Um, has at least one X chromosome, if not, if not two. So what ends up happening is because we have non-disjunction creating these patches of cells that have abnormalities and, and normalities, we can see that this fly actually ends up with one normal red eye, one um, abnormal white eye, one normal wild type wing, and then um, an, an abnormal miniature wing. So we get just patches of abnormalities happening with this type of aneuploidy. All right, so switching gears um, into our last big section, this is going to be polyploidy. And this is where we see the presence of um, more than two genomic sets of chromosomes. So we're used to dealing with um, haploid and diploid uh, sets of chromosomes, so one copy and two copies, respectively. But realize in agriculture, polyploidy is actually a very, very big part of uh, plant breeding. So polyploidy is most commonly going to be in uh, triploids, tetraploids, or pentaploids, which are going to be 3N, 4N, or 5N, respectively. So chrysanthemums, uh, shown here in this slide, um, is actually a diploid species and has 18 chromosomes, but there's also other strains of chrysanthemums that are tetraploid, hexaploid, and octaploid. So tetraploid would mean that there are a triploid species. Hexaploid is, um, is where you have six copies of genetic information, and octaploid is eight copies of information. So when we look at monoploids or individual organisms that have one set of chromosomes, and we look more specifically at chrysanthemums, a monoploid set of genetic information is nine chromosomes. So mono equals one copy of genetic information. In chrysanthemums, that's nine chromosomes. If we have a diploid plant strain, that's going to result in an organism that has 18 chromosomes. A tetraploid is going to have 36 total chromosomes. Hexaploid is going to have 54 total chromosomes. Octoploid, 72. And decaploid, 90. So the, the world of just 1N and 2N individuals is kind of blown all to heck with agriculture commodities because we've actually bred them to be that way, and I'll explain why in a minute. So in meiosis, um, in a diploid chrysanthemum, um, we know that we're only going to have 9 pairs of chromosomes, so that's, um, so that's 18 total chromosomes, and sometimes we call those bivalents. Uh, so a tetraploid um, um, can have upwards of 18 bivalents, hexaploid can have 27, and in meiosis, as we start looking at each gamete, um, that gamete is really only going to receive half of the total chromosome material. So a haploid ga gamete from a tetraploid or a foreign individual will be um, divided in half. So we've got 36 chromosomes in a tetraploid divided by 2 gets us back to 18 chromosomes or a diploid um, set of genetic information. So a tetraploid um, plant has diploid gametes. Uh, so what are the gametes for? And... Um, so in again in a diploid um, individual in chrysanthemums where we know we have 18 chromosomes, nine of those chromosomes are going to be um, actual pairs. 
Okay, a tetraploidy has 36 chromosomes divided by 2, that's 18 total pairs of chromosomes. And then a hexaploid has 54 individual chromosomes divided by 2 is 27 pairs. So that's polyploidy, so multiple sets of genetic information. Now let's talk about monoploid, which is a basic set of chromosomes. And then a haploid is going to be a set of chromosomes that are present in the gamete. Okay, so as we look into agriculture commodities and the, how they were developed all throughout the world, we really have a, a large variety of different crops being produced in different regions. So that has lent itself to being to having ge different genetic structures. So just to give you an idea of some of the plant groups that are um, that are commonly grown with multiple copies of genetic information. Triploid um, organisms tend to be bananas and watermelons. Tetraploids tend to be macaroni wheat, maize or corn, um, cotton, potato, cabbage, leeks, uh, tobacco, and peanuts. And then hexaploid, again, chrysanthemums, triticale and oats. And then our octoploids are a lot of our strawberries, pansies, and sugarcane. So let's make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page. If we're looking at how many alleles we actually have for a single trait, so keep in mind an allele is an alternative form of a gene, and we're looking at a diploid individual that has 18 chromosomes, okay, so a 2N individual, then that individual is going to have two alleles for a single trait. A tetraploid organism that has a total of 36 chromosomes is going to have four alleles because there's four copies of the genetic material. And then a hexaploid is six copies of the genetic material, therefore they have six alleles for a single trait. All right, so polyploidy, why, do, why is it so important to agriculture? And it's really because the act of creating polyploids leads to larger cells and which lead to bigger plants that are more vigorous. So almost always there's an even uh, number set of chromosomes, but if there's an odd set number of chromosomes, then that severely reduces the fertility and they usually can't normally segregate. So this is where seed companies have kind of made some money. So where they've created certain strains, and this isn't a bad thing, this is agriculture and commercialism, but you know they've created strains of seeds that are triploid and cannot reproduce. So you have to buy the seed every single year. Um, and then so and that's because the triploids are infertile. So some of the triploids that we see use uh, used quite often commercially are going to be the seedless varieties that we really like. So like watermelons, cassavas, oysters, and bananas. So a triploid cannot pair because they cannot segregate normally. So this results in individuals being sterile and not allowing um, reproduction to take place for seed production. So again, um, let's, let's look at um, chrysanthemums. So we're going to get into two different types of ploidy, so or polyploidy. So this is auto sorry, auto polyploidy, and this is where all the chromosomes in the species comes from a single diploid ancestral species. So this can actually arise through non-disjunction in mitosis or meiosis, but it's done in a generational or a historic context. So again, if it's happening in mitosis, we're seeing replication happen, then non-disjunction, then separation of chromatids, then non-disjunction again so we don't get the cellular division. Okay, so there's more genetic material in the cell, therefore the cell has to be bigger. If we see auto, um, autoploidy actually happening in meiosis, um, it can happen in meiosis 1 where non-disjunction just isn't segregating and we don't get multiple cells. We get one cell with a lot of genetic information. And then, or it can happen in uh, meiosis two. So we get one cell that is triploid in nature. So the second type of polyploidy is alloplotty 
polyploidy, and this really um, is where our hybridization technology comes from. So when we hybridize two species together, those result in polyploid um, chromosome sets that are derived from both species. So this is where we start to see a little bit of genetic engineering um, taking place at the breeding level, not necessarily creating transgenic plants, but actually allowing certain plants to breed together um, so that we get desirable traits from both plants to make um, to come together and make a superior uh, hybrid. So for example, in our parent generation, if we've got this pink flower here that has chromosomes A, B, and C and has two copies of each, and we hybridize that with the second species, the white flower here, and that white flower has chromosomes G, H, and I and has two copies of that, through the gametogenesis process, we're going to get reduction of genetic material. So we're going to lose one copy of these genes. So we only have one copy of A, B, and C, and then one copy of G, H, and I. So in the F1 generation, we can use the fusion process to actually create an individual plant that has um, six copies of genetic information. Um, so it's got chromosomes A, B, C, and then G, H, and I from the parents. So if non-disjunction ends up taking place in mitosis, what we end up with is an allotetraploid. Okay, so it's like a copy machine, right? So we get an extra copy of chromosome A, B, C, G, H, and I. However, if a gametogenesis takes place and we get non-disjunction happening through meiosis, then we usually get non-viable gametes happening. Okay, so we, we don't really get um, viable gametes through gametogenesis, so we have to put this through a mitotic division first. And then after the mitotic division, we can go into gametogenesis and get um, gametes that are actually going to be formed. So one of the um, common crops that we have is bread wheat or triticum as a veticum. And um, this is a hexaploid that has genes that are derived from three different species. So these, um, these genes might be or might help make the, the wheat more productive, be able to withstand envi environmental um, pressures, etc. Same process though. Um, wild grass crossed with an um, icorn wheat and that creates a new hybrid and then we cross it again with, an, with another wild grass which is the third species and contributes the third different type of genetic information and then we can hybridize that individual to get a new bred wheat. All right, so this just looks at um, this process a little bit more in depth, but it's what we just talked about. So we start with the first two species, cross them, and then that F1 generation that's going to be produced is then going to be crossed um, after mitosis with a new wild grass or a new species. And then the F2 generation results in this hybrid that's going to go through mitosis and non-disjunction again. And um, we get this bread wheat actually happening. So we can control a lot of this now. It's actually really cool technology. So here's just some examples of some polyploidy crop plants. Um, and this is also in your book. So um, I'll let you kind of look through that on your own. And... This really brings us back to the end of chapter eight. So we've looked at a lot of chromosome mutations, but we've concentrated on chromosome rearrangements, aneuploidy, and polyploidy. So make sure that you have a good handle on these three big categories.